This is Jordan Edwards, and this is the Business Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. All right. I'm here with Jason Kalipa, and I'm incredibly excited to talk to you, but your list of achievements of what you've done in business, CrossFit world champion, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, active, competitor, passionate, uh, great social media personality, author, father, philanthropist. I mean, the what you're doing, it shouldn't surprise anybody who follows you because you are an absolute Adonis and beast of a human and the, the discipline that that takes to grow a business and uh, to, to do it in through the lens of CrossFit and being a CrossFit champion. Um, so grateful that you reached out to me. We have some, some so a similar network in uh, the BJJ Fanatics guys and, uh, and then this sport, which we've both fallen in love with, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So it's yeah. a pleasure, pleasure to meet you and uh, become acquainted with you. And I'm, I'm really interested to learn about who you are and about some of your businesses, NC Fit. Uh, I love, love your book, As Many Reps As It Takes. Um, was quickly doing a skim through it uh, before we started chatting. And I, the only real life hack, work really hard. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. it all. It, I, I love it. It's something I share with my team all the time and all my different teams. So Jason, tell us about yourself. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? How'd you get into the, the business world, fitness world? And, and may I also just mention before we move forward, uh, you host an amazing podcast called The Business of Fitness. Yes. Yeah, so really podcast. podcast. Um, yeah. So I grew up here in the Bay Area. So I'm in California. And right now I'm actually at our location in Mountain View, which is kind of like the Google city. And, um, yeah. it's the capital of it's, it's, the, you know, it's the Silicon Valley. And so I grew up here. I, um, went to college here and essentially I got into CrossFit really early on and opened up our first gym in 2008 and then expanded into more brick and mortar, right? Your typical gyms. I'm actually sitting in one right now. And over the years, then we just pivoted as a business, right? We, we had opened up brick and mortar. Then we got into corporate wellness then we got into digital products and um, now, you know, we have licensed partners and we have a variety of different things across um, the world that have made me travel and meet amazing people and develop a great team. And I got introduced to jiu-jitsu probably about 10 years ago, maybe even longer. And at one of our locations, we actually subleased out some of our space to jiu-jitsu school. And I used to always watch these guys roll and I used to love it. And I remember I was on an off season for CrossFit. Maybe I just, I don't know, maybe... I had maybe a, a month or two from competing. And so I decided to start doing some jiu-jitsu and I fell in love with it. But at the time I was competing professionally in CrossFit. So I couldn't risk the injury or the time spent on the mat. So after I you know, transitioned out and I kind of retired from the sport, I really fell into to CrossFit. I mean, excuse me, it's jiu-jitsu. And that was about five, six years ago. So about five years ago, I really got into jiu-jitsu and I'm currently a purple belt. Um, you know, it's been weird for the last year because of COVID, um, but I've still been able to get in a lot of privates. It's been a lot of fun. Who do you train under primarily? So there's really two schools I go to. One is uh, Claudio Franca's here in, it's in San Jose. Another one, I go to Cayo Terra Academy and there's a gentleman there named Benji who, who I do a lot of sessions with. So kind of both schools, I do no gi more with the Cayo Terra crew and I do gi with the, um, the, you know, Claudio Franca's crew. Fantastic. Did you, were you aware of jujitsu when you started your CrossFit career? Like, was it something that you knew existed or it was uh, something you learned on later on? I mean, I knew it existed because I was in a Muay Thai. Um, so I used to work at a traditional health club. I worked the front desk and started doing sales. And, and as I was there, actually a San show at the time, like Chinese kickboxing became pretty popular at the gym. So I got introduced to Muay Thai and San show at that time, started practicing it, training it. And then um, shortly after that, I got introduced to jiu-jitsu a little earlier on, and then I got um, found CrossFit, and that's where I really started competing professionally. And from that point, that was all I dedicated myself to. I mean, because you're you're traveling the world, learning all kinds of these, you know, athletic things like powerlifting, Olympic lifting, you know, gymnastics, swimming, and so I didn't have time to add in jiu-jitsu because it wasn't part of the curriculum for CrossFit. Yeah. We, my wife and I love watching the CrossFit games. I think they do a great job of putting out, you know, the content out on YouTube and I don't know what it is, but it's just kind of like a fun sport to watch. And yeah. you guys are 
incredible. I mean, the thing that really always surprised me about it is you don't know what they're going to throw at you and you just have to be ready to do these events day after day after day. Um, just wild. I mean, you were you you were part of a documentary at one time. Yeah, so I, I've been a part of a few documentaries, but the first one was called Every Second Counts. That was in 2008. I won yeah. the CrossFit Games in 2008. That was really back in the day. Um, yeah. Only four events there. So I, I competed professionally from 2008 till 2015. My daughter got sick in 2016, so I stepped mm. away from competing. Um, but as I competed professionally, I, mean, I competed year round. So the way that the CrossFit Games used to work is it was just the games. Then, because so many people were interested in it, they started having qualification process. Started out online, then it went into like a regionals. Then from there, you go into the games, and then if you compete and you perform well enough, then you go compete for your country um, in like these what they call the invitational. So for a few years, like 12, 13, 14, I mean, it was just year round. It was the open, the regionals, the games, the world championships, and then fortunately, I competed well enough that I would then go represent uh, the USA against uh, the rest of the world. Yeah. And I, well, I hope that your daughter is okay and those aren't lingering issues. That was the thing that stuck out to me the most. Uh, how many children do you have? I have two children. So my daughter is about to turn 10. My son's about to turn seven. And uh, yeah, so she was diagnosed with leukemia. And, um, you know, I mean, obviously we learned a lot through that process. Um, that was like a three-year process. We are now currently three years out of treatment. And we have two more before she's considered cured. So we still definitely have our... Um, small little speed bumps here and there, but in the grand scheme of things, we're super, super grateful and all is going well. Thank God. Yeah, truly, truly amazing. Is that part of your philanthropy that you've you've started? Yeah, we do a lot of stuff for pediatric cancer. So we do, we're heavily focused on uh, blood drives and then pediatric cancer. So, you know, for us, we've, especially the blood drives, they're really easy. And I, I wanna get this expanded into jiu-jitsu schools as well. But basically what we've done over the years is either through our own licensed locations or other gyms is host blood drives because I don't think people realize the importance of blood products until you actually need it. And yeah. it's not, it doesn't require any money. It doesn't require anything. It just requires your time. Sure. Uh, you're, I, I don't really know much about it at all. So you're enlightening me. And uh, you know, on this podcast, I've supported a lot of different charities that people have, but I would be happy to, you know, you tell me where to go and what to do, or I'll find it on my own. Uh, I'm going to support, and I encourage everybody else here to support too. Uh, we have one nurse in my school who, I believe, Michelle, Michelle and Jacques, and I, and they're very passionate about giving blood as well. So thank you for bringing it up, and you have my support. I'm in. Done. <laughs> yeah, there's really two things. I mean, just to kind of quote, like blood drives. Um, just go donate blood. It's pretty simple. You could donate it every couple of months. And then the other thing is um, sign up for something called Be The Match, which is basically for bone marrow transplants. You know, the, 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 the wider the net is cast, the more likelihood you are to find a donor that matches your criteria. So the more people that could just submit their information and say, hey, this is my ethnic background. This is this. This is you do like a basic cotton swab. It's super simple. You never know if one day you might get a call and say, hey, there's someone that needs a bone marrow transplant you would actually align perfectly with them, these factors, would you like to do it? And so I would recommend everybody signing up for it. At the time, if you do get a match, at least you can make the decision at that point. Um, and just something else to look into, call be the match. No money transacted, it's easy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I haven't had any exposure to it, excuse my ignorance. And you know, when it comes to the business world, I know, and I just, it hasn't, it hasn't touched my circle, which is crazy, but um, Thank you for sharing that. So let me ask you about your business, NC Fit. Uh, sure. What does NC stand for? NorCal. So NorCal. we originally started here in Northern California. Um, we were originally called, uh, well, this is a long time ago. We were CrossFit Santa Clara. Then we became CrossFit Mountain View. Then what happened is, and for any business owners listening, the, one of the challenges we had was that we had CrossFit Mountain View, CrossFit Santa Clara, CrossFit this, and there was no one consistent brand recognition. And so then we pulled them all underneath one brand called NorCal CrossFit at the time. This is years and years ago. Then about six, seven years ago, we decided to pivot and kind of create our own brand and really, um, you know, not be attached to anything we didn't have any control over. And so we rebranded officially from NorCal CrossFit NC Fit, um, you know, in 2016 or so, 17. That's great. How many locations do you have? So we have 100 licensed partners. Uh, we have, so we own and operate our own locations. We mm -hmm. operate corporate wellness sites all over the world, and um, we have licensed partners. So between all of them, you know, like 150 sites, 
And then we have a lot of gyms that use our program. So something I think a jiu-jitsu gym one day has to do is we sell our session plans and programming to other gym owners. And we have about a thousand of those. Yeah. So the plans that we use in here, how do you warm up? Um, things to scale. I mean, the full, in, in the video I just showed you where people are filming these plans right now. Yeah. So any gym owner who wants to have a one-stop solution for getting their entire team to share the same curriculum on a regular basis, we yeah. sell that gym owners the same thing we use at all of our sites. Sure. I think uh, that's how Gracie Baja, Baja operates and um, 10th Planet with Eddie Bravo. I believe that's how, you know, his philosophy. He has like his, his system and they share their routines and their warmups and, you know, like what they're working on. And, and I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure Gracie Baja does the same thing. I, I don't know as a competitor or as a participant, but actually I had a Gracie Baja as a tenant, uh, one of my properties in Texas. And when I was in, when I was meeting him and meeting the guy, he was telling me all about their program. And I actually went and trained with him and their whole kids program was based off of a curriculum. So it sa sounds like similar, similar uh, guidelines. Yeah. Well, one of the challenges we had, so we were opening up locations. So one of our big clients, we have some, a few big corporate clients. One of them is Western Digital and another mm -hmm. one is Lucas Films. And so one of the challenges we ran into was we were expanding globally with Western Digital and we were trying to figure out how do we, how do we scale our product? And when you have one location, one coach, it's not that hard. But when you go from one location to two to five to whatever, how do you have a consistent product? And so at the time, I really got inspired from like franchise, for example, like Starbucks. You go into one in China, you go into one here. They might not be the exact same. You might have a slightly better barista. But you're going to have within a certain like, you know, standard deviation. And so yeah. when we started on our own app every day. It's, hey, today we're going to coach this. This way we're going to coach it. This is the work of the day. And right. in, in jujitsu, I think there could be, there needs to be more of that. If, 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 if I was in control of the school, I wouldn't just allow the instructor to come up with whatever they want to teach for that day. And I would have, obviously, a lot of schools have a curriculum but then I would have a daily curriculum that just kept going. Um, this is very common in CrossFit where you have like your workout of the day, but we also then back that up with the warm up, the skill work, the, the scaling options to kind of give like a full, trying to create some barriers that the coach has uh, are, are all lying across the world. Where did you develop this clearly a, a great mind for business? You know, that of course is, you know, looking at someone like Starbucks, applying it to your industry, having tons of success, growing over a hundred different affiliates. Um, this is something I'm trying to tap into with this project. You know, I, this is exactly what I want to try to communicate to people who are starting out. You know, you are someone you, you just said, you're working at the front desk of a gym. You become an active competitor, someone who's winning at a world-class level. And you see someone like, you know, Howard Schultz at Starbucks with this model. And you're like, I need to bring this over to my world and cross scale. Uh, it's just so beautiful to me. You know, it is an opportunity in jujitsu. There's someone, it's waiting for that. It's waiting for that. I mean, you could say this, so especially in jujitsu, and you could say this about many boutique fitness centers, they're started by people that are super passionate. And I think that's really important, right? They love jujitsu. They become a black belt but they don't realize that as soon as they sign a lease, they're not just a jujitsu coach anymore. They're, they're a business owner. And with that comes a lot of roles and responsibilities that maybe they didn't sign up for. For example, you know, the finances, the personal guarantees, how many square feet do you need? How many athletes can you accommodate in a given square footage? These are the things that we start talking about because when I first started out, there wasn't that type of information out there. Now, at least in the CrossFit boutique functional training space, there is more of it. But in jujitsu, I feel like, you know, I would just ask the question if someone wanted to open up a jujitsu gym, how many square feet do they want? Well, most of the time they want bigger is better. But is bigger really better? Do you really want 100 people on the mat? Are you really going to be able to deliver a quality product to 100 people? Or is it better to have two, 3,000 square feet with 20 athletes at a time where you could really have an intimate experience and coach effectively? So you don't need the additional overhead to go out for five or 10,000 square feet. And I've learned that the hard way. I mean, we've had spaces as big as 30,000 square feet and as small as 2,500. And it's those lessons learned that I try and share with people in our space and hope to share with more people in the jiu-jitsu space because it's all one and the same. Are you doing anything proactively to get into the jiu-jitsu uh, realm and maybe bring some of this? But everything you just described, it, it actually reminds me a lot of my first book, which was helping people take that leap to start a business. But they don't know about all, all that stuff. 
How big of a square foot? What's the overhead like? Uh, do you have to get into business insurance? How to set up a bank account the right way? I mean, all these little fundamental things, you learn them. You know, you, you learn them along the way of starting, of getting started. Um, is, is this something you're looking to bring to jujitsu? I mean, look, I just, I've been in the functional training space for a very long time. We have hosted uh, so many business seminars and so many things that are, that are really hyper-focused on our industry, right? We're talking yeah. about the front experience, but there's so many carries over between what we do in, in jujitsu. And so, yeah, I would love to expand into that. Um, you know, and I kind of know my lane, right? Like I'm not going to go out there and go teach, you know, the, I don't know, the side control position that that's just not my lane. And I'm, I'm not trying to do that, but I can say, Hey, these are the things we've found successful in the functional training space. How about over here? Like, for example, having class start on time, you know, pre-registering for class so you could get a better idea of who's coming and especially with COVID, all that kind of stuff. How do you implement those? And how, like, these are things that are just transferable to any boutique fitness space, whether it's spin class, CrossFit or jujitsu. And so, yeah, we, we plan to expand more into that space. That's fantastic. Uh, did you develop your own um, systems, curriculum, application? Like, what, what, how, how do you promote this to all of your affiliates? So right now, I mean, yes, we have, so we have our own app where it's the session plans, the programming, like what we're talking about. And I think someone in jujitsu, again, should do that. For any school, you don't have to be a 10th Planet or a Gracie Ba. Someone should just come out there and be like, hey, look, I have a daily curriculum for any independent jiu-jitsu school that your coaches can all follow, watch the video and do it. Someone I think should do that, but that's neither here nor there. That's not, not for me. But in yeah. addition, we are rolling out, you know, like business best practices. Like, for example, um, what does a coach job description look like? What type of criteria should you get when you hire a new coach? Um, how to qualify them for a W9 or, you know, 1099 or, or W2. And um, all those kind of things are things we want to deliver to people because we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on them. And if we could help people in the beginning through monthly webinars and whatnot, that's what we're doing right now for the boutique fitness space. And one day I hope to do that for jujitsu as well. But it's not like a, I just love jujitsu. So I want to help the schools be successful. Yes, that's exactly how I got here. I, di I didn't start this project or, and I'm not writing this book about the business of jujitsu. You know, my goal or my aim. The goal really was to take the principles and the technical approach that, that we have at jujitsu, like learning techniques and applying them, how I brought those over to the business world and really started to explode in my business career when I realized the interconnectivity of these things. And so one simple thing that you just brought up, and you actually brought it up when you first got on here because you were right on time, is time. Why is this something that's so hard for so many people to figure out, to be respectful of other people's time, to start on time, to have that disciplined approach? I mean, you brought it up two times. It's so simple. It's so but simple. You can't figure it out. It's, it's so simple. And the, the reality is, is that um, I think that it becomes – once it becomes okay, it, once it becomes the norm, then it just kind of snowballs. And I don't think anybody intentionally tries to do that. It just becomes this like lackluster, like, oh yeah, the class starts at 6, 6 p.m., but most people roll in at 6.30. It's like, well, the, does the class start at 6 or 6.30? Like, you tell me. And I think it starts from the top down, is that, hey, people, your members are paying you for a service. That service is from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. If you went to a massage and they started at 610, you'd be like, dude, where's my prorated return for that 10 minutes you didn't give me, right? Any type of service, whether it's a lawyer, massage, anything you could think of, if you pay for a specific time, you expect that time and you don't expect to go over either. And so it goes both ways, right? If the expectation right now with you is that we started at 11 um, a.m. Pacific time, I expect that we're going to go from 11 a.m. Pacific time to let's just say noon. But if you went over, all of a sudden, that's an issue. But if we also didn't start on time, that's an issue as well, because the expectation isn't set right. And so I think in jiu-jitsu and functional training, all kinds of different places, there's like this idea that it becomes like a brotherhood, which I think is great. And the community and the culture, I think that's really important. But at the overlay of everything, needs to be this level of professionalism. And that goes for everything. Are you checking a class? Are the hygiene perspective and, and on time is just a piece of that. Yeah. 
You know, sometimes as it relates to jujitsu, it's been explained to me that that's part of the Brazilian culture and it's very laid back and they're just, that's the way that it was in Brazil. But when I'm talking to someone through the lens of their business in New York, I'm saying, hey, we're in New York, we're not in Brazil. And guess what? It's all New Yorkers and there's business people here and there's people who need to get home to their families. And so just that is a metaphor for all the other things that you need to do right is one of the principles that is so important to find success. And um, I was wondering if there's any other principles that, that, that you use on a daily basis, you know, as an example, uh, leverage, you know, leverage in jujitsu is something that is so explicit. Like you feel the leverage, you feel your bone breaking, you have to tap. But in your business, you're leveraging all of these affiliates in order to grow your business. So I was wondering if there was just anything that you right off the top of your head that comes to you that you love about jujitsu that you've carried over to business. Well, I think obviously the, the, the attention, the focus. So for example, um, I don't know, yesterday morning I was rolling jujitsu and after I'm done, my focus and attention is just hyper, hyper sensitive because when you're in the middle of a jujitsu match or roll or session, whatever you want to call it, you cannot get distracted. And so it goes into this whole idea of AMRAP mentality where when you're there, you're there, right? You're fully focused, you're zoned in. And because if you're not, right, and you get distracted, that's a really easy opportunity for you to get choked out, whatever it may be. And so I think jujitsu really teaches this idea of hyper focus. Um, you know, there's no time you're more focused when some dude's got you in, you know, full mount and you're just getting crushed. All you're thinking about is how am I gonna get out of this position? You're not thinking about your business, you're not thinking about anything else. Now, when you leave jujitsu, how do you take that same mentality and then put in your business? When you're in there, you're all in. Then when you're with your family, you're all in. Then when you're with this, you're all in. Um, that's what I've re really learned uh, specifically from jujitsu is that that clarity. Is that what um, AMRAP, is that an acronym? Is that something yeah. that, what is that? What does that mean? As many reps as possible. So, oh, that's the, your title, of your book. Got it. Yeah. So, so in in CrossFit, that was the, probably the biggest thing that CrossFit gave me is this idea of racing against the clock. So earlier on in my career, when I was working at the conventional gym, whatever, I would go do a little bit of buys and tries, chest and back, whatever you you know, common stuff. But then when I got introduced to CrossFit, this idea of a clock, it'd be like, hey, I want you to do as many reps as you can in ten minutes. And because you now added a clock to it, it added this level of competition and you wanted to see how far you could get. And during that 10 minutes, it was all you were focused on. You weren't answering your phone. You weren't talking to a friend. You were hyper-focused on this one goal. And that's really what the book is about, as many reps as possible. But that same thing carries over to jiu-jitsu um, miraculously, you know, beautifully. Sure. Absolutely. Um, the presence of jiu-jitsu, of feeling you know, the pressure of someone on top of you is, is, in, is extremely intense. You know, you're so in the moment at jujitsu and it's true. The whole world goes away when you're, you know, conducting, playing, training, rolling, whatever you want to call it. You're doing something that is, uh, it's just so beautiful. And yeah, when you do, when you, when you carry that over to other parts of your life, it's amazing. Right, right when you got onto this podcast, you ripped your rash guard off. You had just been training. Uh, and I didn't know if you threw that on to come on the business jujitsu podcast, but no, no, you were actually training. You ripped up the rash guard, threw on the NC fit t-shirt and boom, you were right into the podcast. Yeah. That's beautiful. And, and I mean, obviously I didn't do any of that, like intentionally to like have this conversation, but that's yeah. a good example, right? Is that, you know, I was rolling jujitsu, which you met the guy, Benji, right? Yep. Then boom, I changed into that onto this. And you know, this is also a, an example, right? Where I'm on a podcast. And I'm going to try and be, you know, professional with you, right? Like I'm at our gym, I have our brand back there. And that's the type of thing that we need to think about from moving into the jujitsu space, into anything, is that when you decide to sign that lease, you're, it's, it's not a hobby, it's a business, right? You need to treat it as such because, you know, and I know that some people don't want to talk about money. I get it. But eventually what happens is if you're not generating revenue and growing, you become resentful to the thing that you love the most. And so it's important that when these jujitsu practitioners open up a school, they open it in such a way that they are making money. And I've heard so many times, oh, I'm not doing this for the money. But then after a year or two, they start becoming resentful because it's costing them money. And so if you can open it up from the beginning, really thinking about it as a business, how am I going to make this financially success successful? And what does success actually mean to me? Is it 
employing more people, providing them do what they love for a living, et cetera, et cetera. That's really, really important to start off with before anything is ever signed. What, what, what is success defined for you? How are you going to be able to get there and not allowing something you love building resentment because it's costing you 10 grand a month? So I'm so glad that you brought that up. Uh, I was blessed to grow up in a family business and around family business, third generation, all different businesses, but always in a family business. And we talked about money. We talked about politics. We talked about things that in other families, it may have been uncomfortable. If you're a fam if you're, maybe your parent was a civil servant, maybe they were a teacher and money was taboo. My mother and my mother's family, money was taboo. They didn't talk about money. My grandmother worked a, a, a bank teller. My grandfather sold furniture. My mom, when she met my dad, they went out to dinner. She said, all these people do is talk about business and money. It can be taboo. You're so right. Some people, they just, they never had the conversation. And so I'm wondering, like, what was your, how, how did you grow up? Were you in a business? Were you around the business world? Like, what, what was your first job? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, first off, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, my kids, um, my daughter, like I said, is 10, my son is seven, and they listen to a lot of our business calls. They're around it. They understand entrepreneurship, the sacrifice and, and, but that's because we've owned businesses, right? And growing up, my dad is an engineer. My mom works for a school and my grandparents actually owned a dry cleaning business. So they came over from Iran. Uh, my dad's, you know, so our family's from Iran. And when they came here, basically came here with nothing um, during the revolution. And right. they started over from scratch and they started a, a, a dry cleaning business. And so that was uh, some exposure at a young age. But then when I was 14, 15, uh, 15, I started working the front desk at a health club. My first job was at a community center working the front desk. But at 15, I started working at the health club on the weekends. And then I did that all throughout high school on the weekends, selling, you know, Gatorades and that kind of stuff. And I was exposed to the idea of sales. And then when I got into college, that's when I got into sales. And that's when the owner of the gym took me under his wing and taught me all things about the business. So that when I graduated from college, I had four years of not only school, which was fine, but also two mentors taking me under their wing to teach me sales and then teach me the entrepreneurship business side. And I would be the guy you know, there on the weekends while, you know, before I went out partying with my friends where the owner would call me, Hey, what are our numbers? What's our EFT? What's our total gross today? Every single day, every single weekend, wow. they want to know how much more do we get in monthly recurring revenue and how much do we do in gross? And it started in still this concept of like numbers do matter because they're ultimately going to pay the bills and be able to provide trajectory for our people. It's phenomenal. I mean, I just get chills when I hear these stories. I love these stories. I had guys like that in my life too. Uh, I always had a job. Uh, my biggest job outside was uh, was caddying. You know, I, I would carry the bags and I worked at a golf course and I got that taste and that feel of what it was like to earn serious money as a teenager. And it was just like, I remember when I would come back from doing a loop and I would start counting the cash on my desk it's like 100, 200, 300, 400, 1,000. And I just pile, used to pile it up. And, um, and then, of course, my dad said, you got to put that money in the bank. <laughs> yeah. But the, the feeling of you know, being taken under the wing of a mentor or being brought into a job, yeah. being given opportunity, it's, it, it's beautiful. Like It can almost become addicting when it happens to you, especially if, you just weren't, if it wasn't given. You know, if you didn't grow up around it, if you didn't hear it, if you didn't see it. And that really was the inspiration for this book. Uh, all So many guys on the mat, so many of my teammates always coming up to me, knowing that I ran businesses and asking me these questions. They had a dream. They wanted to leave their job, uh, their career in the, in the police or the military or fire was coming to an end. They're in their early 50s. Now they want to start over again. Hey, I want to start a t-shirt business. I have a bar. Just all these questions that they had. And one that you've brought up twice now is signing a lease. Yeah. Why, in your words, is that the moment? You know, I'm a landlord. I'm a landlord and a retailer, so I do two things primarily. But why is it that signing the lease is this, is this moment of jumping off the ledge? So first off, you know, for anybody listening who's interested in starting a business, and you and I are talking a little bit about money, I just want to be clear that just because we talk about money doesn't mean we're all about money. Money provides yeah. opportunity. Money is the reason why we could expand and the reason why our coaches could do more for a living. So our business model is 
for me to do what I love for a living, just like a lot of people do, then to create that opportunity for as many coaches and owners as possible, and then therefore impact as many members as possible. Then with that greater community, let's go do some good shit. Let's go donate blood. Let's go do philanthropic effort. But the bigger we get, which takes revenue, let's go then do really good stuff with it. And so I think there's this notion, especially in the CrossFit space early on, that if you opened up a second location, you were, quote, selling out. And, you know, at, at times I would be offended by that because I say, who's selling out? We're impacting more members. We're creating more opportunities. Just because we're doing so doesn't mean that we're selling out. It just means we're trying to expand and grow. So I just want to kind of caveat that. Now, you asked a question about leases. Leases, especially right now because of COVID, are, are a very sensitive subject. Um, as, I, I don't think the lease business, at least for me, will ever be the same again after COVID. But to back up to 08 when I signed my first lease, you know, I personally guaranteed my first lease. It was six months. I, you know, I signed it on the hood of a truck. It just really was because this guy believed in me. I had no equity, no money. I had nothing. Right. And when you sign a lease though, especially a person guaranteed one, you're on the hook and COVID, you know, COVID, I know it's an anomaly, but if the government comes in and tries to shut you down for a year, you're still on the hook for that. If you personally guarantee and your business goes under, but you signed a seven year personal guarantee lease at 10 grand a month, you're still on the hook for that. And so you just want to be aware of that. When you go and decide to open up a brick and mortar, with that comes a lot of like hype, a lot of excitement and people to welcome people into your new home. It's, it's, it's powerful. But with that also becomes a lot of responsibility that you took on a large amount of debt. And that debt is known as your lease. And if you personally guarantee it, you're personally on the hook for it. I just think that that's a realization that everybody needs to, to come to and then make their best judgment when they do sign that lease. Absolutely. Uh, the reason why I asked it was a whole chapter in my first book. And uh, the what you want to do, the opposite of a personal guarantee almost is a good guy guarantee. And hopefully if, if someone's watching this and you're starting a business, go look into a good guy guarantee. It basically means if you've been a good guy and you've paid your rent, you can walk away hands clean versus a personal guarantee where you are personally guaranteeing the whole lease doesn't work out. You might be on the hook for you've got two years left. You go two more years of rent. So just uh, just a little a little public service announcement. Good guy guarantee is a, is a good alternative to a personal guarantee. And I, I recommend everybody look into that. What I love about a lease, what I love about an entrepreneur taking the first first leap and signing their name to it and going all in is you're, you're taking a huge risk on yourself. You're betting on yourself to win. And so many times tenants, first timers come to me and they want incredibly favorable lease terms. And if they're a great business, I will happily give it to them. But if it's a first timer who who, who I don't necessarily believe in. And they say, why do I even have to sign a lease? I say to them, your lease is first of all, worth something. Let's say you're going to build out a hundred or $150,000 into your space. Don't you want to have some guarantee that you own it for whatever portion of the time you amortize the, the build out over? If you don't have a lease and you don't pay your rent, well, you're out of here. And all that money that you invested and all that time and all the marketing and your big grand idea, it goes away. So a lease is just this, this moment in time when you start a business that is just such a, a beautiful little thing. And in some cases, it's beautiful because it can protect you. In other times, it's beautiful because it represents that you are putting everything in to make this happen. And uh, anyway, just, just a little poetry behind the business. And also, I completely agree with you as it, as it relates to money. I'm not someone who's motivated by money. I am completely motivated by teaching, empowering, leadership, growth, and all the good things that come off of success. Whatever your definition of success is, money is the thing that comes when you do what you love really, really well. You know, if you do it great, it just comes anyway. Um, yeah. If you're always chasing the money. It always has a way of being your slave. You can just always be a slave to the money, a slave to the cash. Um, I've always looked at money like fuel. You know, it is 
you have to keep putting it into the investment machine in order to keep growing and expanding. And it needs fuel the way that we need water. And so money shouldn't be the ultimate goal. Your ultimate goal should be whatever you're, you dream of. And it's just so beautiful to see what you've done. I just, I love going onto an entrepreneur's website when they have one. And it's like, you're writing books, you're starting businesses, you're doing lectures and you're, and, and you're sharing so openly. You know, why is it that one of the things that, like a victim mentality, typically, I'm just generalizing here, but on a victim mentality, they think that everything that other people have was given, you know, they didn't earn it. They didn't take it. But what I've found, especially through reading and books, is that the most successful people in the world are so open to share. Like they want everyone to be just as successful as them. And it's like, this is what I did. And now I want you to have this success too. And uh, so I'm just, I'm so impressed by all the work that you're doing in podcasting and speaking and writing books. What motivated you? Did you have a mentor or someone that inspired you to do this? I mean, I think ultimately it just comes back to what you're talking about. It's like, you know, I'm a big believer in when the tide rises, all boats or uh, a rising tide raises all boats. I'm a big yeah. believer in that. And this goes for jiu-jitsu. This goes for CrossFit. This goes for anything is that if our industry wants to thrive and impact more people's lives, we need the gym owners to do a good job. If jujitsu ever wants to be more than where it is today, which by the way, it's growing great, it's doing great. But if it wants to grow and grow and grow, you need phenomenal locations with phenomenal coaches to spread a very positive, inclusive message, which will catapult the entire industry. And I really believe that. And so I believe that also for functional training. And so the more information that I can put out, to save people some heartache. I, I not only want to, I almost feel like I have an obligation to because I've had a lot of ups and a lot of downs. We've opened up, I mean, countless locations. I've signed countless leases. Some of them, most of them have been winners. Some of them have not been winners. What could we have done differently? And I share that message because I think that's really important for people to know. So when they go into things, they're at least going to school before they sign that first lease. And that's a huge recommendation I'd have for anybody interested in the boutique fitness space. Go learn from as many owners as you can before you go sign that lease. Because as soon as you sign on that dotted line, the clock starts, right? You might as well go and say, hey, go learn from one gym. Take the things you like what they do, implement it. Take things you don't like and leave it behind. Go Because as soon as the lease starts and money starts having to be paid, all of a sudden, sometimes an owner acts differently because now they're doing things to generate revenue instead of doing things for the longevity of their business. And so you just got to be careful as to do everything you can before you sign that dotted line because you're going to be in a different mindset once you do and you know you have a big nut coming in 30 days. Perfectly said. One of the things, this is a tip for that. One of the things that I do when I'm underwriting a property to go buy is I go talk to all the tenants and I find out, what the landlord's doing, what the landlord's not doing. What kind of person is it? What kind of organization is it? Uh, as a tenant, where I have uh, 12 stores, I say, I have landlords who are the model landlord. When COVID hit, they called me, anything you need, I stand behind you. That's how we were with our tenants. We were said, whatever you need, that we're in this together, it's global. And I had other landlords who said, where's my check? Mm -hmm. And my response to those guys were, the whole world is locked down. Whether or not I can pay or your other tenants can pay is not a function of, it's not in our hands anymore. We're, we have to all paddle in the same direction. And so one of the things that I would advise small businesses, go ask the other tenants in a shopping center. Go find out, go find out the reputation of the landlord you're dealing with. People do business with people and people do business with people that they like. So don't go sign on the dotted line with a landlord who has a slumlord reputation. Mm. You know, because you might go sign at the cheapest place and this guy doesn't invest in his properties. Now you got roof leaks. All of a sudden your mats are ruined. Your insurance premiums are going up versus maybe something was 25% more expensive, but it's immaculate. The landscaping's perfect. You know, the, the parking lot is smooth. And so just do a little homework, you know, to everybody listening to this, do a little homework on the landlords. There's some great landlords and great people out there that really want to see their tenants succeed. And today in 2021, there's this retail apocalypse. There's been literally tens of thousands of stores that have gone out of business. And so oh, yeah. it's a great time to be starting a business. It's a great time it, to be writing a lease. 
It, it is it is a great time. I, I, I so we have not signed a new lease since COVID has hit. We we we're, we're probably going to pivot and start buying instead of leasing, but that's a different conversation. But I do think if I was to sign a new lease today, I would ensure that I added some type of clause that incorporates some type of very specific language that if there was a governmental mandate to shut down, I reserve the right not to have a lease. Or I don't know exactly what that language would look like, but I think for me as a tenant, yeah. I would want to have a protection moving forward because what, what's really scary, this is super scary to me, is that the government has made it okay to shut down your business. That, oh. that in itself has made it really scary to me. And I'm not, this is not a political debate. I'm just saying from a business perspective, that's from, scary. From a human perspective, I, you know, it's, I, I completely agree. Uh, I will, I'm a, I'm a very patriotic guy. I'm pro-government. I think there should be government. I think there should be taxes to a limit, you know? And I believe we went over the limit in this case. And I'm a big entrepreneur and I believe in the power of entrepreneurs. So again, we don't have to get political here, but I do want to rewind for one moment. And just uh, before we wrap up over here, you touched on another beautiful thing, something I get asked all the time, rent versus buy. People oh. say to me, oh, you own, you're in the commercial real estate business. You own shopping centers, office buildings, or any of your mixology locations in, I have a, own a women's clothing company, mixology clothing company. So are any of your clothing stores in any of your real estate? And the answer is actually no. Some of my office properties and my warehouses, those kind of things are I own, but I say, why? And there's an argument to do it. And there's an argument not to do it. The reason why I don't do it is because my, I like to take all of my working capital and open up more stores because right. that's the cash machine. That's the cash. Machine. And also I don't want to have all my eggs in one basket. I rather have a tenant pay me rent and me, it's cheaper for me to pay a landlord in some cases than it is to pay a mortgage. Now that equation, as you mentioned, might be changing in 2021, but I'm in the New York city metropolitan area. Rent is a fortune. So for us, it's made more sense to rent. So I just wanted to ask you, how are you thinking through this problem? Like what, what kind of things are you weighing as you're, you're making this decision? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think in the beginning, if I could advise someone who just wants to open up a brick and mortar, I would probably start by leasing. I would. I would start by leasing because you need to identify your business model and how many square feet you really need. If I went back in time, number one, I didn't necessarily have the capital. That's probably an issue. Not, not as much as looking back on it, our early spaces were not zoned properly. So our early spaces were rare warehouses that I did not get CUPs for. And I simply just was like winging it. But if a governmental agency had came and shut us down, which we've had that also happen, what if I had bought that building for this use, but it wasn't an approved use, and now I'm on the hook for it? So a lease in the beginning, especially if you're not zoned right, and you can have clauses in your lease or whatever, is a good place to start. If I'm not recommending to go into a place you're not zoned right, but if you do, you should probably lease it instead of buy it. Now, that being said, you start off, let's just say 1,500 square feet, but maybe I'll grow it. Or maybe you'd start off with 5,000 square feet, maybe like, oh shit, this is way too big, I need less. Once you refine your business model enough to have the cash flow, to understand what size you want, then I think it's a great time to go out there and buy a property. And so that's kind of where we're at as a business. We've spent a lot of money on leases. We've invested a lot of money in TIs like you're talking about. And we need to start building more hard assets. And so we will be purchasing moving forward because we know what we want. I could talk to you about this stuff all day. I mean, you could do a masterclass in this. It's, it's just, it's so beautiful to have these conversations out in the open because, you know, before podcasting, I really do think that these conversations only happen behind closed doors and you had to get a mentor. You had to find someone who had done it in order to get access to it. Even books, it's hard to go find this conversation happening today with YouTube, um, Twitter. It's, it's definitely easier to get this information, but Anytime that someone like you and I have this conversation for the benefit of people who are doing it for the first time, I don't know how many dozens or hundreds of times I've done this, both as a landlord and as a tenant. Um, I, I just love being able to share it with people because I want more people to start businesses. I truly think that uh, entrepreneurship is the key to unlocking so many of the issues we have now around uh, all the inequalities that happen, whether it's race inequality, wealth inequality, 
starting businesses is such a great way to put the keys back in the hands of just an average person. And so I really thank you for uh, being an active participant in this conversation and coming on the podcast. Um, I hope that I can be of service to you down the road and that we can meet uh, the next time that I'm in your neck of the woods and we're on opposite coasts. But uh, just... Yeah, we'd love to have you out here. I mean, yeah, I mean, entrepreneurship is... My favorite thing about entrepreneurship is that it reminds me a lot of when I used to sell gym memberships. And ultimately, when I was selling gym memberships, your paycheck was directly related to the amount of work, time, and effort you want to put into things. And with entrepreneurship, especially if you have a phenomenal team, you could scale what you're doing. You, 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 you're, you could see the fruit of your labor right in front of you. You can make a decision and say, hey, we're going to go this direction. And it might suck, but at least you made a decision, you went after it. And then you could pivot and go over here. But I don't know what it would be like to work for a company where you could work day in and day out and never see anything that your input and see what actually happens on the output. As an entrepreneur, you can see how your inputs reflect on your outputs, which is really, really rewarding. It's like rolling in jujitsu, but never seeing the benefit of getting your first Kimura on somebody, right? Okay. In entrepreneurship, it's beautiful because you're working, 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 and then you see the fruit of your labor. Now on the flip side, there's also a, uh, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. I, I don't think that you have to be an entrepreneur to be successful. Identify what you're uniquely good at and go team up with people to, to execute on that. If you're a really uniquely great jujitsu coach, but maybe you have no desire to be in business, you probably shouldn't go out there and open up your own gym. But what if you partner with somebody and you stay in your lane, they stay in their lane. It's a recipe for something really beautiful. So I just wanted to share that. I love it. I love it. Well, let me just uh, pull up on my screen a couple ways that our listeners here can find you. Uh oh I can tell I, you. Yep. I mean, Here's your uh, Instagram, Jason Kalipa. That's probably the best way. Yeah. Uh, your link tree here, of course, has all the links to your, um, to your businesses. And um, your podcast is The Business of Fitness. I'm just going to pull that up momentarily. Like business, business, business of Fitness, available on Spotify and other channels. And it is great. You're a great podcast host. Uh, very, very grateful that you came on mine. All right. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for jiu-jitsu. I'm a big advocate for the business of fitness. Obviously, you like the business side of everything else. And so it's great to connect with you. I really appreciate your time. And I want to stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely.